Good morning and welcome to our service of uh, word and prayer on this beautiful day where we come to uh, worship our God. Before we begin, there's just a few words of welcome uh, that we've taken out of uh, our Bible. Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We will now have our first hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. In reading this hymn through, it dawned on me that uh, some important phrases there. I came to Jesus as I was. I came to Jesus and I drank. I looked to Jesus and I found. Let us sing these words now, reminding us of how Jesus cares for us. announcements. The first announcement is that uh, all the links for the uh, services connected to St James Menangle can be found on the website and in particular the, uh, the connect for the service. 
through YouTube. There is also a, a Zoom meeting that will be uh, at 11 a.m., which you're all invited to join in and, uh, and just share. We do have our weekly and fortnightly Bible studies. Their links are there on the front page of that website. So don't forget to uh, keep looking at menangleanglican.com.au. Uh, you'll also find there that there are bank details for those people that uh, you know, want to give to the church and its work. Um, we don't have the ability to do the offertory plates, so we really encourage you to use the direct crediting system through the bank system, bank account system. The next one is the uh, National Church Life Survey. I must say we've also got our census happening, but um, this is the survey that is conducted every five years. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be done over October and November, and uh, we will receive kits that we can then distribute. It'll be an online system. Uh, so we need to uh, just plan to have this done in an orderly fashion, uh, but just keep that in mind. We will keep re repeating that through our announcements. The next one's a very important time. It's the Grandparents Conference. And this year, due to COVID, of course, um, Interfering, we, it will be held online on Friday the 3rd of September, um, commencing at 9am. And to do that, you need to register by going on to figtree.church backslash events or call them on, that, on the number. So that's the Grandparents Conference. Final one we have. Our Archbishop has sent us uh, a video uh, which is giving us words of encouragement, so we'll now play that video for you. G'day, Kanish Raffle here. I wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you to the churches of the diocese for your prayers for Kaylee and me as we've stepped into this new role. We're very grateful. Of course, uh, due to the lockdown, we've had many cancellations. We haven't been able to uh, visit churches on a Sunday or attend other gatherings that have been planned. Like everyone else, we're looking forward to fellowship face to face. But of course, we realize that at the moment it's so tough for so many people in our churches and across communities around the city. I'm so glad that in the midst of this, you're connecting with church today and often at other times during the week as well. I know ministers and ministry teams, paid and volunteers, service leaders, musos, tech people are working so hard to make sure that we can hear the Word of God together each week. What a gift that is, that we can sing in our own home, strong and in my case, slightly flat, but we can bow in prayer together and seek the Lord who knows us and sees us and loves us and hears us. It's an important time to remember the promises of our Saviour who loved us and gave Himself for us. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Upon this rock I will build my church and nothing will prevail against her. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus has not left us alone. We have his word, we have his spirit, and we have each other. I'm so glad you're at church today. I know that very many of you are keeping in touch with fellow members of your church or Bible study and reaching out to your neighbours as well or others you know across the city with phone calls and Zoom catch-ups as exercise buddies, practically helping out with shopping or in whatever way restrictions allow. That has to be a pandemic silver lining, and I thank God for it. What local churches are doing in this time is beautiful, and your Father in heaven sees it. 
Please continue in prayer for those in authority, those leading your church, those working so hard to keep our community safe for everyone. Pray for those who are suffering, who are anxious or alone. If you need to, reach out to a friend, to your church, to Anglicare. God is not on mute. Jesus is not locked down. The Spirit is with us. His Word is not chained. I hope you're encouraged in your time together today. And I'm praying that as we continue together through this testing time, God will grow us in faith and love and hope. God bless you. Now I, I invite you to join in saying this uh, prayer of preparation together. Together. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, Lamb of God, for you were slain, and with your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, the people of the nation. To, sit, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. We will now uh, have two, two readings and prior to uh, the readings we will just uh, commit this to prayer together. Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped with every good work, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading today will be Psalm 121, one that is well known to us all. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep you going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading will be presented by Catherine. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 22. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptised. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you.
for I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. After this, Paul stayed many yet days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Senkei, he cut his hair for he was under a vow and they came to Ephesus and he left them there but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Catherine. At this time, I now invite Jim to present the sermon. Gracious Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures, their precepts, promises, directions and light. In them, may we learn of Christ, grasp his truth and have grace to follow in his steps. Amen. Today, we come to the end of Paul's second missionary journey. And I'd like to show you something interesting about this journey and Paul's team. At first, Paul travelled through Galatia with Silas. In Galatia, Timothy joined them, and the three travelled together, strengthening the churches. But all of that changed when they reached Philippi in Macedonia, where they were no longer strengthening churches they'd already visited, but they were proclaiming the gospel in new places and forming brand new churches. So let's zoom in. At Philippi, we are told that Paul and Silas left for Thessalonica, but we're not told anything about Timothy. However, in Philippians 4, we read this. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. So I'm guessing that Timothy stayed behind to help build up the church, which was financially supporting Paul. Then Paul and Silas moved on to Berea, and at some point Timothy joined them there. But Paul left Silas and Timothy in Berea to strengthen that church while he moved on to Athens. And Timothy and Silas are still in Berea when we get to today's passage in Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Well, let's zoom in on Athens and Corinth. Paul left Athens and journeyed about 80 kilometres down to Corinth, a city that sits on this narrow land bridge between Athens and ancient Sparta, connecting the mainland Greece to the Peloponnese. And at Corinth, Paul met Priscilla and Aquila, 
who left Italy when Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. And for now they've settled in Corinth. And with Timothy and Silas still in Thessalonica, Paul needs to earn some extra money. And so he returns to his trade, building tents. So Paul lives with his fellow Jews, works during the week, and then tries to persuade the people in the synagogue on the weekend. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are interesting because of what we're not told. How did Paul meet them? Were they already Christians? I mean, it's possible, but but it's doubtful. Did Paul share the gospel with them? Did he evangelize them? Did he baptize them? We're just not told. By verse 21, we're told that they shared the gospel with Apollos, who would later be so influential in Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 16, we know that there was a church meeting in their house. So obviously they become Christians somehow, but we're not told where, when or how. Now Paul's arrangements change. Everything changes when Silas and Timothy arrive from Macedonia in verse 5, at which point we read that Paul stops making tents and he devotes himself to preaching the word and testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Now I take it that that's because Timothy and Silas are now able to support him either by their work or perhaps because of the funds he's received from another church, whether Berea or more likely Philippi. There is a time when he has support and he can devote himself to the preaching of the word. And there is a time when he has to build tents. Now I'll pause here because uh, sometimes Christians debate, what, what do we do with ministers? Should we pay for ministers? Should we just have tent makers? I am very fortunate at New to have Gary Dibley in my congregation. Gary is a tent maker. His full-time work is with CMS, but he assists with a number of ministries at our church, and he's even preached at Menangal. Gary has the same training I've got through Moore College, and in my opinion, he is an excellent minister. I thank God for him and I highly value his counsel. So we thank God for our tent makers. Now I've come across two ministers in my time who were wealthy enough that they were actually able to pay their own wages while they worked in the local church. They had the same training that I've had, and they could devote themselves to full-time ministry without needing to be paid a cent. I thank God for people like that. And by the way, if that's you, you're watching today, uh, there are a number of people in the church here at Menangle that would love to talk with you. But then there's another form of tent maker. And we have lots of those. We have people who serve as wardens, parish councillors, service leaders, lay preachers, Bible readers, prayers, video editors. You're able to partner in ministry here because you earn your money in other ways so that you can serve. Even if that's the pension. But for the most part, the tent maker has two limitations. Sometimes it's training. There is enormous value in having well-trained gospel ministers, and there really is no substitute for good training. But then secondly, there's time. If you have to work full-time, there's only so much time you can devote to the ministry. And so, when Silas and Timothy arrive, Paul devoted himself to proclaiming the word of God in Corinth which, of course, stirred up the usual disciples and the usual opposition from verse 6. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Tidius Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptised. So the Jews resist the gospel. They blaspheme, by which I assume they rejected Jesus as Lord. And so Paul, like the watchman of Ezekiel, he declares himself innocent. He says, I've warned you, you haven't listened, your blood is on your own heads. And he declares that from now on, he's going to speak to the Gentiles. Now, I don't think we're meant to understand he never speaks to Jews again. 
uh, since in verse 19 of this passage, we see he goes straight to the synagogue when he reaches Ephesus. I think rather he means that in Corinth now, he's shifting his ministry from the Jews to the Gentiles. But his preaching was not completely fruitless either. Most notably, Crispus, the actual synagogue ruler, became a believer, as did Titius Justus, whose house was conveniently next door to the synagogue. So the church is next door to the synagogue. The synagogue ruler joins the church next door. That had to be awkward, didn't it? But unusually, Paul received some direct encouragement from Jesus in verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now here I just want to point out the promise and the command. The promise is unusual. No one will attack you to harm you. Now, after Paul's experiences in Galatia and Macedonia, that must have been encouraging. And it's such an unusual promise. After all, in Acts chapter 9, Jesus told Ananias that he would show Paul how much he would suffer for his name. See, there there is no promise of safety or freedom from suffering in the Christian life. You and I can catch COVID-19 just as well as anyone else. Yet here, in Corinth at least, God promised Paul protection. Perhaps Paul really needed it. Perhaps he was so badly discouraged and affected by the ways he'd suffered that God granted him an act of kindness. However, the promise is still tied to a string of commands in verse 9. Don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent. Well, why would God give these commands to Paul? I think for the same reason every command in the Bible is there. It's there because you don't want to do it. Presumably, Paul is afraid. He's tempted to stop speaking. And so God gives Paul a word of encouragement. Keep going. And consequently, he does. Paul stays in Corinth for another year and a half. You know, a couple of years ago, I found this book by Christopher Ashe. I really bought it with no idea what it was about because the title was so catchy and because I've read Christopher Ashe before. This book exists so that you might encourage your minister. He wrote this book to help congregations encourage their pastors. But I want to suggest another use. I would like to suggest that this would be an excellent book to read for people who want to encourage others who partner in the ministry of this church. This book can help you think about how do I encourage those people who are serving our congregation, who are already ministering to you while you wait for a full-time minister. There are plenty of people who serve in a multitude of ways who could do with your encouragement. Now, one of the sweetest things that can happen in the church is when someone encourages you to keep going. And most of us need encouragement from time to time, particularly at the moment. Ministry is hard at the moment. And so I'd encourage you to read this book, if only that you might encourage one another. And for all of us, this this verse that we've been looking at is a reminder of why our time in God's word is so important as well. God spoke to Paul directly to encourage him for his work, and God continues to speak to us today through his word. Therefore, encourage one another with the word of God. That's why there's a Bible in the glove box in my car. That's why I take the Bible on any pastoral visit. It is the word of God that encourages us to keep going just as it did for Paul. And that encouragement must have come in handy from verse 12. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. 
But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So Paul is again brought forward to be judged. And since Gallio was proconsul for a very short time, this happened around 51 AD, give or take a year. But there is a complaint. Under Roman law, Jews are allowed to exercise their religion with some freedom, but it was not permitted for others. And here is the Jewish judge that Paul's teaching is contrary to the law. In other words, Paul is not a Jew any longer. He's not teaching the Jewish rules. I suspect the intent is to show that if Paul isn't Jewish, then he ought to be punished. But Callio doesn't even try to hide his contempt for the Jews. He doesn't care. He doesn't want anything to do with them, so he drives them away. And in their anger, they turn on Sosthenes, who I take it is the new ruler of the synagogue. He replaced Crispus, who joined the Christians. So the Jews take their anger out on him, and Gallio couldn't care less. Well, to make this story even more amusing, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he introduced the letter as being from him and Sosthenes. So there's a very good chance that this Corinthian synagogue had to recruit another synagogue leader, having lost two of their leaders in as many years. Well, with that, we come to the end of Paul's second missionary journey from verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Cancray he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. And notice who Paul leaves Corinth with. Priscilla and Aquila. It seems that this time Timothy and Silas stayed behind again while Paul left with his new travelling companions. And on the way home, Paul makes three stops. The first is at Cancrate, where he shaves his head on account of a vow. Now, I suspect this serves a dual purpose. Firstly, he's taken some sort of vow, and he is shaving his head as a marker of fulfilment of the vow. And secondly, when he returns to Jerusalem, it will show the Jews that he himself is an orthodox religious Jew. See, the gospel is never against Jewish law. It says the law is good. But neither does it place the Gentile under the law. But it is important to recognise that many of the early Christian Jews, they never gave up their Jewishness. They continued to obey the law, but they recognised that their salvation was by grace. Now, of course, we wonder what the vow was. But, of course, the text doesn't tell us. I suspect it may have been related to the vow that God made to him at Corinth. And Paul shaves his head because God did keep him safe from harm the whole time he remained in Corinth. At the second stop, then, is Ephesus, where he goes into the synagogue and debates with the Jews. He was invited to stay longer but declined, adding that he will return if God wills. And he did. On the third missionary journey, Paul did return, staying in Ephesus for more than two years. But this was not that time. Right now, he was keen to get back. And so his third stop in verse 22 was Jerusalem, where no doubt he reported how he had delivered their letters to the Gentiles, declaring that they were not obligated to obey the Jewish law, as well as sharing the details and the fruit of his ministry in Macedonia and in Greece. And then finally, he returned to Antioch, back to where his missionary journeys began. In verse 23, he sets off on his third missionary journey, but that's a story for next term. Now, there are a few things that have stood out to me from these first two missionary journeys that we've looked through this term. 
First, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus always grows disciples, but brings opposition. The second thing that struck me is the value of the team ministry. A range of people exercising a range of ministries, sometimes in different places, in order to grow God's church. And I think this is an important word for Menangle right now. See, the, the minister does not do all the ministry in a church. And therefore, ministry is not put on hold while you wait for a new minister. Ministry is always the work of the saints in a church. And it's something you do together. Please keep ministering to one another. Keep supporting one another and praying for one another. You are the church of God. And God has brought you together for such a moment as this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, look with compassion on the world you have redeemed by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Move our hearts that we might offer ourselves for gospel ministry, whether full-time or whether serving in your church. Fill us with your truth. Clothe us with holiness, that by our lives and labours your light might shine through, and the coming of your kingdom be advanced. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Uh, at this point of the service, we shall now join in singing or listening, as the case may be, to our next song, which was uh, one we had new last week. It's called Hear Our Prayer.
we shall now join in saying the Apostles' Creed together. Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. We will now continue with prayers. Uh, just prior to us going into prayers, just some, um, the Bible tells us to confess our sins to God and from Acts we have a reminder, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come to the Lord. And from Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Let us pray this prayer of confession together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. Uh, here's the words of declaration of forgiveness. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son Jesus Christ in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. At this point, I invite Catherine to come and lead us in our prayers. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, give us a sense of your presence as we bring before you our prayers for ourselves and for our world. Lord God, you know that we cannot put our trust in anything that we do. Help us to have faith in you alone and mercifully defend us by your power against all adversity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Come now, turn aside for a while from your daily employment. Escape for a moment from the tumult of your thoughts. Put aside your weighty cares. Let your burdensome distractions wait. Free yourself for a while for God and rest a while in him. Enter the inner chamber of your soul. Shout out everything except God and that which can help you in seeking him. And when you have shut the door, seek him. Now my soul say to God, I seek your face. Lord, it is your face that I seek. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, our heavenly Father, whose love sets no boundaries and whose strength is in service, grant to the leaders of this nation wisdom courage and insight at this time of travail. Give to all who exercise authority determination to defend the principles of freedom, love and tolerance. Strength to protect and safeguard the innocent and the clarity of vision to guide Australia into the paths of justice and peace. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, in the quietness of our minds, those people for whom we have a special concern. 
including those of our church family and others known to us. Let us pray for those in the front line of this crisis. Help them to stay strong and healthy. Let their hands be your hands at work. Let us pray for the sick and the sorrowing, the lonely and the oppressed, those who mourn or struggle for meaning in their lives, all for whom today will be marked by difficulty beyond their powers to cope. Help them to find their rest and support in you, and may you give strength and courage to those who are their carers. We also pray for our medical teams, doctors, nurses, and all who are on the front line of this crisis. It takes a kind, selfless heart to care for those who are sick. We also pray for our children, keep them safe and able to continue their education with the support of their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give thanks, most gracious God, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of your abundant creation to the honour and glory of your name, now and forever. Faithful God, receive our intercessions and thanksgiving on behalf of the church and the world. Hear our prayers and renew the stewardship of this earth with the riches of heaven. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Catherine, for those prayers. We have one more song, which is one that uh, everybody should know, how great thou art.
that God his son of sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great the Lord, how great the Lord. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then shall I bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great the Lord, how great thou art. Wonderful words. So we trust that you got, uh, that you were uplifted by uh, singing those words in your homes. As we uh, bring the service to a close, let us say this uh, prayer together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let us join in the grace together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Just one rem a reminder, uh, the 11am the for our Sunday Connect by Zoom uh, and we also have a prayer meeting at 4.30 each Sunday afternoon. And we very much encourage people uh, to join in that as we need uh, the power of prayer to uh, uh, either cope with what's going on or to uh, help us become more resilient to it. So that's the end of our service and thank you very much. And may God bless you for the week ahead. Thank you.